So happy to have Eddie Kingston from All Elite Wrestling on with me today. Eddie, welcome to Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversation. So happy to have you here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. So what is it like to be in AEW at this point in your career, getting easily your biggest exposure and your most high-profile matches? Uh, it's it's very surreal to be here now and in, in, in the point of my career. Uh, it's also a lot of pressure because I put it on myself. And, you know what I mean, there's a lot of growing. You know what I mean? I never had to deal with being part of a company this big before. I've been part of big companies, but nothing like this. So it's it's I'm still learning. <laughs> well, congratulations to you on all you've you know done in AEW. It's 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 been an absolutely amazing run and I really enjoyed it. Um you wrote about your life and specifically your battle with depression in your very important piece in the Players Tribune. First of all, again, thanks for doing that because oh, I think it's, cool. a, it's important. Um that open up conversations with other people about getting help. What was kind of the feedback you ended up getting uh, from that piece? Uh, just everybody was real positive about it. And you know what I mean? For me, I don't like that kind of attention. Like in the ring, I like attention when I'm in there, you know, fighting. But outside the ring, I really don't like that, uh, like attention. But getting the attention from that, knowing that people that I talk to are now open and talking more about their mental health to their significant others or their family. That means a lot to me when I do these autograph signings, meet and greets for AEW and, you know, I have little kids or, or, or their moms and dads or, or anybody coming up to me telling me that like that piece helped them or that they're going through it. And I just tell them keep fighting. You know what I mean? Like this is normal to me, you know, mental health is a normal thing. So. That's why I tell people. And always in wrestling, they say, you know, that, that the character you have is kind of you turned up. And I think that your appeal, you know, to your fans is you're real. What they're what they're getting is you. So I think in a way, you know, that, that story, too, connected with people just because they they already connected with you on, on some level, you know, through through your talking and through your through your, through your work. Would you agree with that? Yeah, just the, the Eddie Kingston character. And I use. Uh, quotations. It's just me at 17 years old, turned up a thousand notches. So that's why people say it's real because it is. It's how I used to act. I used to be like this, out of my mind. You know, not out of my, but you know, an angry kid who just wanted to fight all the time. So you know, that's why I guess people relate to it. Also, uh, I'm a '90s guy. It's '98 forever in my mind. You know what I mean? So I just know there's a lot of people out there who who are like me from that generation who want to see something real. And I, I was actually interested, excited to get you on the show, too, just because uh, I would always hear about Yonkers from my parents, actually. <laughs> my, my parents' first apartment in the, the 70s was actually in Yonkers at Allen Towers, wow. I think, on South Broadway in Ludlow. Yep, I know exactly where it is, yep. So, yeah, my, I was asking my mom, but I'm like, you know, I'm talking to a Yonkers guy, so I just need to know all your Yonkers information. They lived there for like <laughs> three years, so I, I, I was just excited to get you uh, get you here. But uh, you're one of the most captivating talkers in pro wrestling. As I said, it's, it's, it's a lot of you. Do you think you'd be able to tell other people like how you get to that point in your, you know, in, in kind of communicating um, to get them to kind of connect better with people, like, you know, what would your advice be for, for people, uh, you know, wanting to get better on the, on the talking side of things in wrestling? I just, uh, I tell them, what are, what are we first? Number one, what are we promoting? You know what I mean? Who, who are you? Who's your opponent? What's the date? All that stuff. That's important. First, get that all out the way. And then you can add whatever you want to it, whatever's honest and what feels right to you. What feels right to you may not feel right to everybody else, but there will always be that little hand, you know, little group of people who will relate to you if you're honest. People, for wrestling fans in general, can understand when something is manufactured. Yeah. They, they know when something's not real. They know when the office is pushing something down their throats they don't like it they want to cheer for what they want to cheer they want to boo what they want to boo that's why i tell people i don't change you either cheer me or you boo me as long as you're reacting to me i'm happy so i just tell people you know find out who you are and be honest find a piece of you turn it up a thousand notches and be honest with the people all right 
When are you going back in the broad, broadcast booth? I know that you are far from done in the ring, but I really, really enjoyed the stuff you were doing on Elevation. You have a ton of personality, but also just a ton of wrestling knowledge, the how and the why, and a glimpse into some of the personalities you have. And I, I would love to hear that again. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Did you? What did you think of doing that as, uh, as something uh, to kind of put on your resume? Oh, I had, I had fun, man. I had a blast doing it because I've done it before out on the independence, but mm. you know what I mean? Doing it at AEW is a different level. And uh, I had to kind of stop doing it because I got busy yeah. with uh, Chris Jericho, which took seven months of my life away. So <laughs> I wasn't in the mood to do commentary at that point in time. I don't know when I'm going to go back. <clears throat> really all depends on my mood when, you know, uh, Tony Khan gives me a little bit of leeway with, hey, Eddie, we would like for you to do it. And I'm like, I can't because I got to fight this person or that person. Yeah. So I don't know. When it's when when I have a minute to breathe, I'll probably go on. I, I just found it so fun and so enjoyable, especially you and Shivani. Yeah. And <laughs> that was always fun and his reactions to you. But also, like, I'm listening to you and Taz, and I'm like, you know, I'm a New Yorker. Like, this just feels like I'm walking down the street in New York yeah, City Yeah, my right dad now. said that. My dad said really? that. Yeah, he was like, it sounded like you guys were just on the corner. <laughs> That's exactly what it other. sounded like. But it's good because there's still so much knowledge and, and 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 experience in there too that it's just. I'm sure for maybe somebody in like South Carolina, it might sound a little. Yeah, a little but, you know what I mean. That's why you may need a South Carolinian in there, you yeah. know, to help us out. Um, you mentioned him before, but how proud are you of the matches you had with Chris Jericho and kind of what were your expectations for them and when, where did they kind of rank for you? Uh, in terms of your career? Oh, I hated them all. I hated every single one of them because I don't like any of my work. Plus, I don't like Chris. So just being in the ring with him was was a headache. It was seven months of a headache, but I'm, I'm proud that it's over for now. You know what I mean? Knowing Chris, he'll probably do something to piss me, uh, get me mad. See, I almost said, you see, I'm watching myself. To get me <laughs> mad and we'll probably get back in there. But no, uh did I learn a lot? Yeah, I learned what it what it was to be a snake backstage like Chris. I learned how to uh, avoid people like Chris and his group. So I did learn from it. I did learn. But it was seven months of my life that I can't ever have back. So thanks a lot, Chris. And now heading into All Out, you'll be taking on Sammy Guevara. You guys have obviously different, very different styles. How do, how do you think you two match up? And what do you kind of think of him in the ring? And what, what do you think fans can expect from uh, the match with Sammy Guevara? Well, I don't, I don't even know if that match is going to happen, to be honest with you. I haven't gotten a phone call. No one said that he signed the contract or anything. So I don't know. I don't know if that match is actually happening. That's still up in the air. There's a meeting. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's a meeting that's supposed to happen in a week or two to see if we're doing this match or not, if he's going to sign the contract. I know he got his lawyers coming in. Uh, I have my lawyer coming in, but my lawyer is, you know, it's not the best lawyer in the world, but <laughs> I guess, you know what I mean? Plus, you know, they want me to wear a suit and I only have two suits for funeral and court. So I don't know. I have one suit. I'm sorry. That's for funeral and court, but uh, we'll definitely see what happens. But if, if people, uh, you gotta say something, Sammy has a huge ego. So if, if people tweet and, and cause he loves reading his Twitter, I don't know if you noticed, but uh if, if people tweet about it enough, he'll probably sign the contract. And what can people expect? He's going to try to get away. He's going to try to high fly, and I'm going to try to ground him and punch him in the mouth. I don't like him as a human being, so there's going to be some extra shots in there. And I'm not going to get too inside baseball about why I don't like him. I just don't I don't respect him. And he's going to have to earn, earn my respect in, if that match happens. Again, yeah. there's a meeting in two weeks with his lawyer and my lawyer and, and Tony Khan and their lawyers to see if we could figure out this uh, contract situation, if he's going to sign it or not. Do you like getting involved in matches that are kind of styles clashes? Maybe somebody that is a, is a dissimilar style to you? Yeah, I like any matches. I do. I just like fighting. I like fight. Well, I, first off, I like wrestling, but it always – Always ends up in a fight because somebody wants to test me or I want to test them. You know what I mean? I take responsibility for it too. But uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I love just being in the ring in general. It doesn't matter who it is. Even if it's Chris Jericho, I, I'll still love to be in the ring. 
how is your involved? How is, excuse me. How is your enjoyment? Is what I meant to say of wrestling kind of evolved over time? I know in the in that the piece that you uh, wrote for the Players Tribune, you mentioned uh, seeing the, the Tupelo concession stand brawl on a on a tape when you were a kid. Yeah, and then and yeah, anybody that follows you on social media sees how much you are into kind of you know, studying the game and super into all Japan and the pillars in the nineties yeah. and stuff like that. But how, how has that kind of evolved over time with, you know, kind of your enjoyment and then actually being also a wrestler while you're, you know, you know, kind of consuming all this stuff. Uh, I got into, I've always been into pro wrestling, but being in the business has also opened my eyes up to a lot of different things. Like I didn't know anything about the world of sport wrestling with like Dave Taylor and, and Johnny Sane and, Jim breaks until I got into wrestling. So seeing that world of sports style, I guess you want to call it. And then that evolved with fit and, and regal. So watching that stuff, learning from that, uh, I got I got into Lucha a lot more recently. Interesting. You know what I mean? From the rivalries and stuff, because I tell you, man, I love YouTube and I love the video essays. A lot of these guys do on pro wrestling. Cause it's like, they're the last historians really. And uh, one guy did a thing on Lucha, and I just started looking it up, and I really got into it, too. So I'm always learning. Uh, I'll watch the same match a hundred times, you know what I mean, and, and just break it down and, and always find new things that I like from it. What specifically about All Japan kind of spoke to you? Uh, it was so realistic when I first saw it, you know what I mean? Uh, in 95, the first... All Japan match I saw was Kawada versus Kobashi in 1995 from Osaka Pro where they went 60 minutes. And I had no idea who either guy was. I bought the tape because I had Muda and Chono on it. I didn't even know there was different companies. But I got it and, and just seeing how physical they were and, and how they got in there and how they got in each other's faces and everything like that, like, Man, those chops by Kobashi and those kicks by Kawada. I've never seen anything like that. And for 60 minutes, besides the Bret Hart, besides the Bret Hart, uh, Shawn Michaels match and Ric Flair Steamboat two out of three at Clash of Champions. Yep. Uh, those are the three matches that like, because there's been a lot of 60 minute matches, but those are the three matches that I can actually sit down and it doesn't feel like 60 or 55 minutes have passed. You just get consumed by it. You just yeah. like, totally get, get get so into it that uh, you don't realize that they're the short matches that probably feel like they're about 40 minutes long. Yeah, too. and like again, like I said, I had no idea who Kawada or Kobashi were, but when I saw them, that that, that was it. It was a, I fell in love, let's say. I really enjoyed your match with uh, Kanosuke Takeshita Thank that you. was on uh, television uh, recently. How did that kind of uh, – how did that feel to get in there with him? He's He seems like he's a – a big guy who's a great athlete and just a very interesting match for you. Yeah, I, lo I loved every second of it. It's a style that I enjoy. It's a style that I I'm still studying. Uh, the King's Road or Noah style or All Japan style, whatever you want to call it. I'm still studying it. I'll never be uh, – I'll never learn all of it. But that that's the point. I want to keep learning. But uh, being in there with him was amazing. Also, it, it was kind of like one of my tests for me to see if I could beat this kid who's a young up-and-comer up who's learning under one of my heroes and one of my dream matches under Jun Akiyama. So he's studying under him. So it was, ah, if I don't get the match with Akiyama, this is probably the closest I'll get to him. Yeah, I know at the post-match uh, interview that you did, you kind of give the wink to the camera, say hi to Jun Akiyama for me. What would that be like for you to get in there with him? I'll leave wrestling afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you just what's have the, everything accomplished at that point. Well, besides being the world champion, what's what's the point then? You know what I mean? Like the dream matches for me are either whoever's the world champ, uh, Mayor Fuji, uh, Kenta, Akiyama, uh, uh, Go Shinzaki, a bunch of those guys. And there's a bunch of, trust me, New Japan guys like Tanahashi that I'm dying to get in there with. But, you know what I mean? After all those guys and without – you know, the world championship, there's no point for me to be wrestling anymore after that. You know what I mean? Those are the only goals that are left still for me. 
And, and it seems like touring Japan is probably a pretty realistic uh, thing for you now. With you know, where yeah, I would love at. to go back. I would love to go back. I went for Osaka Pro in 2011, so I would definitely love to go back for. Of course, everyone you know knows New Japan. Of course, yeah. that would be dope. Me and Tana in New Japan, <laughs> and it'll be all new, so, op- all new opponents. I would think too, because I, I don't think Osaka Pro. What year was that that you did that? That was 2011. The Osaka Pro, I think, just reopened. Zeus just took it over. Oh, okay. But yeah, who, but who, yeah, no, I would love to go New Japan, like you said, the, all the stuff. I gotta, I gotta get Ishii back. He beat me at Strong, so I gotta get him back. You know what I mean? So. And he's unbelievable too. But I just think there would be so many fun matches that you'd be able to do. And oh, and, I'm and, ready and, to go, man. I'm and, ready to go whenever they can. You know, whenever Tony Khan says, "You know what? Let's do this again." I, I have a saying, and I stole it from a friend of mine, Jimmy Jacobs. And uh, the saying is, "It's not my show. I can I can give you all the matches that I want that I think personally will draw, will get numbers, or I would. I I also selfishly, I just want them." But yeah. again, it's not my show. You know what I mean? Akiyama, though, I want on AEW. If I can get anybody, it's him. That would be fantastic. And I, I just think that environment, I think the fans would, uh, I think they'd connect with you similar to how they do here. I think they'd appreciate, you know, the, the studying that you do and the work that you put into you know, the authenticity of. You I'm know, still learning. Home. I'm still learning the Japanese style, man. Like last night I was up till two in the morning watching uh, old New <laughs> Japan from 92. <laughs> Who, who was on that? I, I was watching Choshu against uh, uh, Mudo in ninety in ninety two. I think it was. That's, so that's I just, the, uh, I'm always I'm always watching, always studying, always trying to learn something new from the past. So would Muda at that point have been Figure Four doing the yeah. Figure Four? So yeah. Figure in the orange figure, trunks. Classic. He's still got Figure Four versus the Scorpion Deathlock. We've seen yep. that a few times in the, the U.S. I think too. Yeah, those two. Um, your match in the opener for Bendor, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, uh, Yuda about it when we had him on a few weeks ago, but I thought that was one of the best on the show with you right. and Yuda and, U- and Umino against uh, Jericho and Guevara and uh, Minoru. Um, what what did you think of that match? I just thought it was such a cool, it's so many different <laughs> weird people you'd never expect in the same match with each other. Yeah. Even you know, if you look at that two, three years ago. No, yeah, definitely. It was a fun match. It was a, it was a battle. Anytime I get in there with Suzuki, it's it's, it's an honor, but also a fight. It's, yeah. it's a weird it's a weird thing. Like you're, you're kind of honored that he hit you that hard, and you know you're you hope he's honored that you hit him that hard back. You know, especially with the chops. But um, Yuda, Yuda has a very bright future. Both of those guys do. Yuda and Shooter both have a bright future much more brighter than me. You know what I mean? They're on the good side of their age right now. And um, it was honestly, if you want to talk about honor, man, I've known you since he was really like a really, really young kid. So being on pay-per-view with him in the opening match with Suzuki in the ring, it was, it was, it was definitely a trip. And I, I gave him a hug afterwards and just, you know, told him I love him and, you know, keep, keep going forward. You know what I mean? I felt like Uncle Eddie because I had to deal with Shooter and Yuta. You know what I mean? Those are Mox's <laughs> boys. And here comes crazy Uncle Eddie. I, I hadn't seen Umino a whole bunch before then. I had seen him a couple of times, but I, I, I thought he was absolutely outstanding in that match and really stood out and was probably the guy that the fans knew maybe least of yeah. the six of you going in. And I, I just thought he was absolutely uh, tremendous. A lot of us knew A lot of us knew that he would do that because a lot of us have seen him before. But also, uh, before the pandemic hit, I was in the United Kingdom for three months, right before the pandemic hit, and he was out there for uh, Rev Pro. Oh, Great okay. promotion out there, Rev Pro. And uh, I think he also did OTT in Ireland with me, I think. So two great places overseas, but two of my favorites, by the way. Uh, but I got to see him over there, and you could see him developing, and you could see him changing and morphing and getting more and more comfortable. And if people thought he was good at Forbidden Door, I'm telling you, he has time, he has age, and he has that spirit yeah. to be a, a, a top guy, just like Takeshita. They have that spirit, that fighting spirit. And people think fight. No, it's a real thing. They have that fighting spirit to move on, to keep going, to get better. Who watches more wrestling, you or uh, Regal? 
Regal. <laughs> really? Regal without a doubt. Regal without a doubt. There's certain things I can't watch because I'm just like, ah, oh, this is boring, whatever. But he'll he'll find everything. See, I'm trying to get on his level. I'm trying to yeah. get on his level where he finds the good in everything. Even if it's one little thing, he'll find that good. It just seems like he knows at least of every wrestler I could probably think of. Yeah, he knows too much. That's why I tell him sometimes. I go, you know way too much. We've got uh, the Grand Slam coming up next month at Arthur Ashe Stadium in Flushing. That's why I want Akiyama. Put that out there. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's put that out there. In That'd a be... dream world, in a dream scenario, it's me and Akiyama opening opening that show. That would be outstanding. And, and what do they call that now? Manifesting, I think. Manifesting <laughs> right now. Tony, it, when Tony Khan sees this, he's going to go, why? Why? Why are, you, why are you doing this to me? Well, I endorse that because I'm going to be there. So there you go. Even, even better. Uh, what was that card like for you uh, to be at last year? You closed out the show with Moxley against uh, yeah. Archer and uh, Suzuki. I think Homicide was uh, yep. in there too. What, yeah, that's my man. Yep. What, how nice is it to be able to wrestle on cards of that size so close to home? It was nuts because uh, I was tense the whole day. And then when the match was done, I just remember going to the back screaming and yelling how happy I was and you know what I mean? Getting all amped up and AEW and da, 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 all this stuff. So, yeah. no, I felt great, man, and I can't wait to do it again. Uh, New York, New York's a beautiful thing. New York's its own animal, and I love it. And um, I was going to ask you about Homicide. That was what I was going to ask you about, yeah. about, about his involvement there what, and what he's kind of meant to, uh, to your career over time. Yeah. He means everything. He's one of the rare guys who never quit on me. For some reason, he kept... He would call me fat, lazy, you know what I mean? Get out of my own way, What are you, your, your temper, but he would always still be there. He would always pick up the phone and call me the next day. Homicide is the reason why I'm here at AEW. Homicide is also the reason why New York Independence stayed alive for a while. Uh, Homicide is the reason why Ring of Honor took off. A lot of those Ring of Honor guys that, became world champions, had to go through him first. He was truly the, like the gatekeeper. Yeah. If you can go with him, you can be the world champion. And then when he became world champion, too, same thing. And then he went to TNA, became NWA world tag team champions. You know what I mean? So, like, that dude has done everything, but he also is still humble and still helps me. He's still, you know, I got into a little bit of trouble, so I don't want to call him right now. See what I'm saying? <laughs> He's like a dad. He's like an older brother to me. I got into a little bit of trouble, so I don't want to call him, but he already knows, so I'm going to have to call him, and he'll yell, he'll yell at me and all that good stuff, but uh, without him, I wouldn't be here, honestly. I would have quit or something bad would have happened along the, uh, you know, before I got here if it wasn't for him. It's, it's fun to still see him doing his thing, too. Um, out of his mind. He's out yeah. of his old man Logan. That's what we call him. Because I'll never forget, he said he was hurt or something, and some tag match me and him had. He's like, oh, I'm kind of banged up. I'm like, all right, take it easy. He didn't, not, not at all. You know, he's not not at all. I didn't even know. He, I looked at him. I said, you're not hurt. There's no way. All the things you did in the ring, like, you're not hurt. He's like, no, I am. I go, you're old man Logan. So that's why we all, or, or, or everybody in the little group that we have now call him that. One of the uh, I, I, I'm up in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. So uh, uh -huh. our local our local promotion is uh, Northeast Wrestling, yeah. which uh, which you've been working for quite a bit lately. I was just mm. going to ask you about wrestling for that promotion. I don't think you ever you were never really in there. I don't think in, in a lot of your run until now. Uh, but you've been uh, doing a lot of matches, doing a lot of shots for them recently. Yeah, I'm having a blast. Mike's great. You know what I mean, Brian Anthony. I like beating up a lot. He's fun to beat up, but uh. No, it's a great promotion, and it's been going for a while. And I, I always wanted to work for NEW, but with just things never worked out. I, You know what I mean? Like, on the independents, you have to get your things booked quick and early so you can know and break down how much money you're going to have by the end of that weekend. So a lot of times Mike would hit me up. I re what, would already have bookings. But I'm blessed and lucky now to be able to do it, and I'm having a blast. Every time I go there, it's so much fun. Got to see Mick Foley last time, so it was good to see Mick and also Mickey James. It was good to see them run into them. And that was the was that the Great Adventure one? Yeah, yeah, and okay. Six Flags. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Um, so we're going to move to something we call the three count now. It's going to be three quick questions and, uh, okay. and your answers. We try to tailor them for the specific uh, person. Put so back. I wanted to see if you could give me three match recommendations of things that our listeners have probably never seen before, but should. Wow. There's more than three. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we only have so much time. Probably, I know, so. I know, I know. So, yeah, yeah. But what, oh. what, are three, what are three matches people should watch if they haven't seen them already? Uh, uh, Kawada versus Kobashi, June of 98. I think it's June either 6th or 11th of 98 for All Japan Pro Wrestling. I show that to fans who, who aren't fans of All Japan in the King's Road style or whatever you want to call it. But I think that match, you show anybody that, they'll get it. There's no East, there's Easter eggs and stuff from other matches, but they don't need to know it. They'll get that these two guys are trying to win this championship and they're doing everything they can to win. So I actually did a podcast about it. It's somewhere on YouTube hmm. uh, for post wrestling called Walking the King's Road. Oh, cool. I did a podcast for that, breaking down that match. So that, that match for sure. Uh, Man, uh, Masawa versus Jumbo Saruta. Wow. Uh, God, I think it was June. I think it was another June one, May or June, when Masawa beat uh, Saruta, and that kind of changed everything for all Japan at the time. That was the moment where everything switched, where the younger generation of guys was being led by Masawa, you know, took over. Uh, also, I, I, I got to tell people, man, I've been watching a lot of Mid-South wrestling from 1982 to 1985. Mm -hmm. this, the, the TV was great. You know what I mean? You're not going to sit there and see hold for hold uh, grappling, but the TV was amazing. So I, I would have to say all the TV of that. So those, those three things. And any matches that stand out for you in Mid-South that really uh, struck your eye lately? Uh, it's really mostly the angles that get yeah. to me. You know what I mean? That's what the TV was about, especially back then in the 80s. It was about selling out the house show. Because right. that's where they made their money. So right. the TV was basically an infomercial for whatever show they were having for the house shows that week. So that's why they had to have all these crazy angles. Again, wrestling was different then. They didn't I, I, give away like these five-star Matt classics at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was more about the angles and the emotion. And, you know what I mean? You hear stories about guys pulling out guns on the Freebirds because they were going to beat up Junkyard Dog. You know what right. I mean? So you hear all this stuff, and it, it's more about the angles and the entertainment and what catches your eye more than anything with the Mid-South TV. In interviews I've done with uh, with Duggan and with DiBiase, I always love bringing up Mid South to those yeah. guys just to get them get them talking about it. Have you have you gotten to pick Jim Ross's brain at all about that or Jake Roberts? Yeah, or anybody? yeah, yeah. We definitely talked about it. It was rough. And, it was a rough, rugged time. Yeah, for them over there. You know, what I mean, every time I talk to guys about it, they've always said that was the hardest territory with traveling and and the boss <laughs> and yeah. everything like that. But it made for really good. Uh, TV, their TV was great, and some people even say that. And I don't know how true this is, but this is what you hear throughout the years: is that Mid South TV was like the first episodic pro wrestling television. Yeah. You know what I mean? Usually, it used to just be matches, matches, matches. To you guys, Wednesday in West Virginia or something. I don't know. Yeah, but, you could definitely binge Mid South because it definitely yes. does flow one episode to the next and yeah. you don't get And they lost. always show what happened the week before. Like I just watched one from 82 where they had Dusty Rhodes, Andre the Giant, and Junkyard Dog teaming up together, you know, in a six man. So you get some fun stuff like that, you know? So maybe once on commentary, you'll need to wear like the Boyd Pierce jacket. Uh... No, never. I can never pull it <laughs> off like him. I can never pull it off like him. God bless him. Those are the ugliest jackets in the world. But he, he could definitely pull it off. You know what I mean? He definitely, definitely, definitely could pull it off. Oh, one more match real quick. Yeah. I mentioned Old Japan. I'm going to give you a New Japan one that I love to death. It was the first ever G1 Climax, 1991, mm -hmm. between uh, Mudo and, and Masahiro Chono, the finals. See, this That's is interesting for me. Matches. This is interesting for me now because I've never really gone back and watched 
old all Japan. So now I have some recommendations for myself. Yeah. You know? yeah. There's so, a bunch. I can give people a bunch, but those yeah. those are the ones I think good, are important. Good place to start. Uh, I wish someone had them all translated. That would be all the old old Japan mat, like matches translated. I don't know how that works or how much money that would be. Probably more than I have. I think that's got to be Eddie Kingston and some play-by-play guy on commentary. Just, just coming, breaking it down break, for me. I think that would be me. fun. I think it would be fun it would, to do. It would be, definitely be fun. I would just need to know a lot more before yeah. I embarrass myself. Uh, so second question on the three count. What's your favorite place to visit in New York? My mom's house. No, <laughs> I'm a mama's boy. No, uh, my favorite place, man, is uh, uh, to visit when I'm home. Oh, man. Uh, there's a couple of bars. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly not. Nah, there's this place called Angelo's Pizzeria. That's I, I love. I love it. There, New York pizza is the best. So yeah, I'm I'm biased. Where is that in New York? Uh it's right across the street from. It's in. I think. I think it's considered Yonkers, but it's right on the borderline between Yonkers and Bronx. It's right near Woodlawn, but it's also right near the uh, elementary school I went to as a kid. It's right there, St. Barnabas. So. It's right, it, you know, special moments of that pizza is where you went on your first date when you were like in fifth grade or something. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know what you were doing. You know, holding hands was a big deal. And uh, finally, last three count question what, Who's your, uh, I, I was kind of looking at who you, maybe your favorite old school wrestler was of all time. Anybody you like going back and watching, or maybe somebody that's a little under the radar for people that people should kind of maybe rediscover. Well, uh, Terry Funk's the GOAT. I'm oh, yeah. put that out there. I know how everyone has their goat conversations. This man's the goat. It's been proven. Yeah, he was a wrestler, then he was a brawler, and then he was hardcore. All the he changed every generation. He's the goat. That's it. If you want to see over, watch Terry Funk in Japan. Him and his brother. People were fainting, and 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 you know what I mean. All that stuff. But so Terry Funk's the goat. Uh I just don't think a lot of people give a lot of credit. And also, I've been on a Mid South kick. I yeah. also. Uh, just uh, I didn't read the book Audible, by the way, uh, of uh, called King of New Orleans about Junkyard Dog hmm. and how he doesn't get enough credit for being like the first black athlete to be a top guy in a promotion, not champion, all that stuff, but like carrying a company. Yeah. And hearing that book and, and listening to, you know, what the guy wrote and everything like that. He doesn't, Junkyard Dog, it, it, it's sad that he doesn't get enough credit. Like, to me, there should be a statue of him somewhere in Louisiana. Because even now, you, you, when we went to Louisiana, I'll never forget an older woman, older black woman came. It was at the show. And she said she enjoyed that I had the thump shirt on. Uh-huh. And she was telling me how much... You know, oh, the dog was a bad guy, and he would beat up everybody. That's why we loved the dog, because he would beat people up. And it put a huge smile on my face, but also made me kind of sad, because I think the young girl dog doesn't get – he gets more credit for his demons than he does for what he did in 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 the sport. And then also, once he kind of made money, you know, he made the jump to WWF – which yeah. I'm sure was great for him financially, but that's what people, I mean, that's what I grew up on. I was five years old. Yeah, yeah was... we are, but how great was he when we were kids? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think, he was so fun. Yeah. I think the only person was Hogan who rivaled him, maybe. You know Popularity, I mean? like 85, one, 86, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Another one bites the dust. The people at the garden would go insane. Yeah. It was, so I just I, don't think he gets enough credit. You know, the, the wrestling wasn't a crazy or amazing, but the, the charisma it was and the over. way he would I mean, get the yeah. people. And uh, I just don't – again, I'm on a Mid-South kick again. Yeah. I get on Mid-South kicks every, like, month or two. I think that's good, though. Yeah, it's, it's also, a, it's also I was crazy on a world-class you... kick last week. So, But uh, I just think – oh, Terry Gordy, too. Though, they talk about Ooh, world-class yeah. kicks. Those are two guys who don't get enough uh, credit or play. It's crazy how young Junkyard Dog and Michael Hayes were when they win the headline, too. Yeah, 1981, Superdome. I think Hayes was like 21 years old or something like that. Absolutely. I tell you right now, if I was 21 years old making that kind of money and doing all that, I would, <laughs> I wouldn't be here today. I tell you that much. I tell you what, with Terry Funk too, I had the opportunity to see two different matches of his, both of which were billed as his last match at Poughkeepsie. Oh, of course. Like nine months apart. One was for 
northeast, and then the other one was for Tommy Dreamer's. Uh, oh, I was there for that. I was there for hardcore. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. When he t- I think he tagged with uh, Dreamer against uh, Sean Waltman and Lance Storm. I think was yes, yeah. It was and definitely it was, and I just incredible. Was at ringside. Yeah, and it was great. You know, Terry. God, Terry Funk is. I hope more and more people. Anytime I do anything on TV, when it comes to the old school guys, whether I wear a shirt or I mention them, like. When I mentioned we're going to beat Jericho up like Butch Reed style and Junkyard Dog style or whatever, I like to mention these things because I want people to know where we all came from, yeah. where this business evolved from, you know? And and I just also think these as, as pro wrestling gets more and more popular as time goes on, of course, I just want people to remember them. Like, don't remember me. I'll be all right. You know what I mean? My, as long as my mother and my brother and my family remembers me, I'm good. But it's these older generation guys that I would like to see uh, be remembered. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Bobby Eaton. You know what I mean? It's He was one of the best workers to ever do it. Workers, wrestlers, whatever you want to call them to ever do it. You know what I mean? I hope people never forget Dusty Rhodes, how charismatic he was with with flair and the horsemen it's just i just hope people remember the history it's, and it's good know, that we all have it kind of digitally available to us now too but i think how you're lucky, under- how lucky I, are they i, I used I, to have to wait for tape traders and then the, the thing will be crappy and you're sitting there messing with the tracking button yeah <laughs> and you still get the middle line but you're like this is the best it's gonna be so you're watching it you know? i have totally been there with, yeah same thing with japanese wrestling I, I want people to you know understand about ricky dozan and and, and giant baba and anoki like the forefathers of it all for what it is now you know what i mean new japan is huge and you know a goal and all that stuff but i want people to understand where it came from and yeah. why and, stuff like and that. you're underselling yourself but that's okay like in like 20 years well what do they call that now we're going to be giving you your flowers and uh, i'm good i'm good <laughs> give my flowers to, to the wife Somebody i'm good <laughs> very good well, without any- without without her i wouldn't honestly without her without homicide without ruby riot without monkey ortiz and several other people who i'm forgetting i hope i apologize uh don't take offense but without all these people I wouldn't be here today. So give them the flowers because they had to deal with my crazy ass a lot. So give them the flowers, man. Dealing with me, my mother too. Give it to my mother and father. Dealing with me is not easy. Very good. Well, Eddie Kingston, I have really enjoyed talking to you today. This was a lot of fun. I could probably do this again and we could probably just talk about old school wrestling for the entire We could. Uh, we could. It'd get me in trouble with probably the other old school guys if I get something wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's the world's so fast now. Who's going to remember? Yeah, very true. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for joining us today on Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. Really enjoyed it. And best of luck to you with all, all the stuff you've got coming up, too. Thank you, man. Hopefully, you know, put it out in the universe. Akiyama. Uh, Akiyama Kingston. Sam, and also, hopefully, the lawyers can work out something with me and Sammy for All Out. I'm not making promises, but I'm hoping. Very good. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, man.